Uh, we are in the seventh week of a sermon series on the renewal of work. And, and the topic today on the eve of Women's Day is women at work. The text for today is a very familiar passage. Uh, it's Proverbs 31. Proverbs 31 verses 10 to 31. A wife of noble character, who can find? Her worth is far more than rubies. Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. She brings him good, not harm, all the days of her life. She selects wool and flax and works eagerly and works with eager hands. She is like the merchant ships bringing her food from afar. She gets up while it is still night. She provides food for her family and portions for her female servants. She considers a field and buys it out of her earnings as she plants a vineyard. She sets about her work vigorously. Her arms are strong for her tasks. She sees that her trading is profitable and her lamp does not go out at night. In her hand, she holds the distaff and grasps the spindle with her fingers. She opens her arms to the poor and extends her hands to the needy. When it snows, she has no fear for her household, for all of them are clothed in scarlet. She makes coverings for her bed. She is clothed in fine linen and purple. Her husband is respected at the city gate, where he takes his seat among the elders of the land. She makes linen garments and sells them and supplies the merchants with sashes. She is clothed with strength and dignity. She can laugh at the days to come. She speaks with wisdom and faithful instruction is on her tongue. She watches over the affairs of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. Her children arise and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Thank you, Kia. Verse 31. Honor her for all that her hands have done and let her work bring her praise at the city. This is God's word. This passage has has been so often misunderstood and misinterpreted. Yes, this passage celebrates the many virtues of women. But ever since I, I can remember, this passage has always been held up as some kind of a benchmark for women to live up to. That is not the original intent of this passage. One of the misconceptions about the passage is that the target audience of this passage is women. It's not. The target audience of this passage is men. There's just one command in this entire passage of 30 verses that we read. And that command is meant for men and not for women. And that command is in verse 31. Honor her all of us as men, for all that her hands have done, and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. If you look at the entire passage, this passage is about a woman being celebrated. And that's not a burden of expectation she needs to bear. That's not the command. This passage does not command women, do all this, then you're a good woman. That's not the goal of this passage. The goal of this passage is commanding men, that's the only command in this passage, commanding men to honor and praise women publicly. You'll find this interesting. In Jewish culture, the Bible was initially Jewish and Jesus was born of a Jew. In Jewish culture, men were supposed to memorize this passage so that they could sing it to the women in their lives to their wives, to their daughters, their sisters, their mothers, and, and their friends. That was the goal of the passage. So let us not misunderstand this passage. This passage is not a burden of expectation that women are supposed to carry. Let me speak to a moment, for a moment to women. Let me first wish you all a happy Women's Day. Women. 
This passage is a celebration of the fullness of womanhood. But this is what I'd like you to take home from this passage. Biblical womanhood does not force you to be just a wife or just a mother. Biblical womanhood does not compel you to be just a homemaker or just a career professional. And as a woman, you were not created to be objectified for your beauty or your sexuality. This passage and the entire Bible is calling you to celebrate womanhood as nothing less than the very image of God. Genesis chapter 1 verse 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. So women do not settle for any paradigm of womanhood that is any less than the very image of God. So to be female is to be made in the image of God. Every other role that you carry so well, be it wife or mother or career woman or professional or entrepreneur, is a mere subset of your larger and fuller identity of someone who is made in the image of God. Now, with that preface, uh, allow me to draw two things for us from this passage. First, how the Bible opposes wrong stereotypes of women. That's the first thing I want to draw out for us from the passage, from this passage. Second, I want to close by talking some more about women and the image of God. How the Bible opposes wrong stereotypes of women and women and the image of God. Those are two things we're going to be looking at. Let's look at the first thing that I'd like to draw for us from this passage. How the Bible opposes wrong stereotypes of women. One of the ways women are dishonored in society is when they are typecast or force-fitted and, and limited and sometimes even almost imprisoned into certain roles. And I want to talk about three such wrong stereotypes today. The first stereotype is a woman, a woman as a mere wife. The first wrong stereotype. The second wrong stereotype is a woman as only a homemaker. The third wrong stereotype, merely beautiful, merely sexy, objectified. We're going to be I want to spend some time talking about how the Bible opposes each of these three stereotypes. The, how this passage specifically. Let's look at the first stereotype, first wrong stereotype. A woman as a mere wife. Being a wife is part of womanhood, just as being a husband is part of manhood. But when we dilute and reduce womanhood to the role of only a wife, we are dishonoring women. That said, if you are paying attention to the passage that we read, uh, the first verse, especially from the passage, you're going to ask me the question, isn't the Bible typecasting women, uh, women into the role of just a wife? Think of the first verse we read from the passage. A wife of noble character, who can find? She's far far more than rubies. Immediately the question arises, isn't the Bible typecasting women into the role of just a wife? The answer is not at all. While verse 10, the first verse from the passage we talked about, just, I mean, we talked about, does talk about the woman's role as a wife, there are large chunks of the rest of the passage that talk about her as an individual in her own right, made in God's image, and does not talk about her as just somebody's wife or somebody's daughter. Look at, look at verse 16 from the passage we read. She considers a field and buys it. 
out of her earnings she plants a vineyard out of her earnings she is not acting merely as her husband's representative in choosing to buy the field she is exercising her independent judgment and she is buying the field with the money she has earned she is in was investing it wisely in her best judgment she is an individual made in god's image she is not just a wife if you read this passage you'll have to say yes she is an excellent wife but being an excellent wife is not the only thing that she is being celebrated for in this passage she is being equally celebrated in this very passage for her excellence in entrepreneurship we've seen that she buys a field her trading is profitable we're going to look at that some more and so this passage does not typecast or limit women to being only a wife this passage talks about married women and how married women must be honored other parts of the bible also talk about single women and how single women should also be honored jesus christ was was radical he was radical and he broke existing jewish norms about the way he he uh, treated and honored single women mary the sister of martha we saw it earlier the call to worship was sat at jesus's feet and learned from him in that culture only a male disciple could sit at a rabbi's feet and learn and learn and jesus invited mary a single woman to sit at his feet as his disciple jesus also extensively encouraged single women to participate and even contribute financially and in other ways as well to his ministry here on earth look at luke chapter 8 verses 1 to 3 soon afterward jesus went on through the cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of god and the 12 disciples were with him and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities mary called magdalene from whom seven demons had come out and joanna joanna the wife of chusa herod's household manager and susanna and many others who provided for them out of their means these women single and married were providing for jesus out of their means all of us know that mary magdalene was single joanna who's mentioned here she is a wife but susanna was most likely single too and there were other single women who supported jesus these women not only went along with jesus from town to town as he was preaching the gospel but they were also supporting these were single women supporting jesus to meet the financial needs of jesus and other disciples lastly the first person to see a resurrected jesus christ was mary magdalene a single woman this is this is remarkable so if you consider the role that jesus gave single women in his ministry you would never believe that the bible typecast women as just wives and even in the early church we see paul honoring lydia a single woman and also several single women who were functioning as deacons and co-laborers in the gospel in the early church and so the bible disapproves this wrong stereotype of a woman as a mere wife a woman is more than just a wife but i do have one caveat to make jesus honored single women jesus did not endorse a reluctance to commitment in both men and women jesus celebrated singleness but jesus did not endorse a lack of commitment god created all human beings to be committed in a community of interdependence interdependence god does not endorse singleness as an expression of a fiercely individualistic 
lifestyle. In God's eyes, both singleness and marriage are celebrated as two different expressions of commitment to the community. Married women and men are committed to their biological family. Single women and men, as Paul explains in the book of Corinthians, can, can be even more committed to the spiritual family or the church or to mission because they're free from the commitments of a biological family. So whether you're a man or woman, whether you're married or single, we're all called to be committed to others just as Christ Jesus was committed to us. So if you're embracing singleness as mere individualistic freedom and as an expression of a lack of commitment to others, that you're committed only to yourself, if you see singleness like that, that is not biblical. I, I do need to be clear about this, this. And obviously this applies to both women and men. And that brings us to the second wrong stereotype of a woman, that a woman is only a homemaker. Many societies do stereotype women as only homemakers. Sadly, very sadly, there's also a strong section of Christians who view and who would quote the Bible to justify that, even more sadly, that a woman's role is limited only to the home. This is not at all biblical. I spent some time studying this passage and I made two lists. The first list is all that this woman who celebrated did as a homemaker. And the second list is all that she did entrepreneurially and as a career woman. And here's what the two lists look like. First, all that she did as a homemaker. She made sure the home lacks no grain. She sought wool and flax for her home. She sourced food from afar. She rose before dawn to provide food for her household, etc., etc., etc. And here's the second list, second list, all that she did as a career woman. She considered a field and brought it, bought it out of her own earnings. She planted a vineyard. She worked vigorously, presumably, presumably in her career. She traded profitability, profitably. She is charitable and generous again presumably from her own earnings. And so clearly, the kind of woman this passage celebrates is not just a homemaker, she is also an entrepreneur and a career woman. She is active and fruitful both within the home and outside. Now, when we celebrate a woman's role within the home and outside, we must be careful not to impose any of these roles on any woman. It is her prerogative. It is her calling. That is between God and her. To what extent she feels called to any or every role. Some women might choose to choose to be just homemakers because they believe that's God's calling on their lives. Some women choose to be more career-oriented if that's what they sense is God's call on their lives. Some women want to do both. Some women want to do everything. <laughs> and that's really up to them. It's not for us to judge. And Roshni was talking about women being judged. It's not for us to judge. A woman has to, is free to discern God's call on her life by herself. And as husbands, for those of us who are married, as husbands, our goal, our role is to make sure that a woman is flourishing, that our respective wives are flourishing into the whatever it is that God has called her to. And so this celebration of a woman's role, both inside the home and outside the home, is not only in this passage in the book of Proverbs in the Bible, it is in the very DNA of God's creation design for all of humanity. Let's look at Genesis, a book that we've been reading going back to over and over again in this sermon series on the renewal of work. I'm going to read uh, Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 to 28. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. 
God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. There are two commands that God is giving both Adam and Eve. The first command is to be fruitful and, and multiply. This obviously is talking about the family. The second command is to rule over all creation. We've been seeing that this ruling over all creation happens through our work, our careers, our vocations. Here's the thing. God did not say, woman, take care of all that's inside the home, and man, go out and take care of everything that's outside the home. Not at all. God called man and woman to together take care of the work within the home, be fruitful and multiply is a command both men and women. It doesn't mean be fruitful, multiply, and let the wife take care of the children. <laughs> That's not what it means. Be fruitful and multiply means have babies, make babies, and take care and provide leadership to the babies. So God called both man and women to take care of work within the home and outside the home together. The call of dominion, rule over the earth is not given in an isolated way only to Adam. It's given to Adam and Eve together. This is God's creation plan. So the wrong stereotype that women are only homemakers is not at all biblical. When it comes to women in society, there are two equal and opposite errors. The first error is the traditional error. The traditional error holds that women can only be inside her home. She cannot work, she cannot have a career, she cannot run a business, she cannot be the president or prime minister of a country. We've seen this is wrong. We've seen this is not a biblical view at all. The second error, and it's an equal and an opposite error, is the error of hyperfeminism. Now, before I describe this error, I do want to state up front that feminism is not bad. Feminism is good. A world in which women are still dishonored, disrespected, unrecognized, uncelebrated, abused, enslaved, paid less than women on most jobs, given less opportunities, paid less than men on most jobs, given less opportunities than men in most areas, a world like this needs feminism. Feminism is not an error. Feminism is good. The error I'm talking about is not feminism, but hyperfeminism. What's the difference between feminism and hyperfeminism? Feminism seeks to bridge the gender gap. Hyperfeminism seeks to wipe out the gender difference. And there's a world of difference between the two. To say that women are not treated well, women are not paid well enough, women are not given enough opportunities, and therefore the gender gap needs to be bridged is good feminism. The Bible, Bible advocates this. The world needs it. God is for this kind of feminism because he's a God of justice and fairness. But then to say that there is no difference between male and female, that we must completely wipe out any gender distinction, and to say that gender is totally irrelevant, that is hyperfeminism. This is not biblical. God is against this. Have no doubts about it. Male and female are absolutely equal in God's eyes. But male and female are not the same in God's eyes. Male and female are distinct, designed distinctly so that they can complement each other. So we must wholeheartedly embrace gender equality, but we must also wholeheartedly embrace gender distinction. Male and female, he created us. We've got to live joyfully with those distinctions. Let's come back to the, to the main flow of the sermon. We've been looking at how society dishonors women in many ways. 
apart from stereotyping women as a mere wife, and apart from stereotyping women as merely homemakers, society also objectifies women for their beauty and their sexuality. That's the third wrong stereotype. Merely beautiful, merely sexy, objectified. This too is very obviously wrong. Those are the three wrong stereotypes of women that the Bible opposes. With that, I want to move to the second and the last thing that I want to draw out for us from the passage. Women and the image of God. Women and the image of God. Let's take a long pause here. I do want to voice out an objection that you probably have. If not an objection, I'm certain you have at least a clarification to ask to make at this point. All you've said is wonderful. It's beautiful that women are in the image of God. It's beautiful that the Bible is, is rejecting all these stereotypes, wrong stereotypes of women. It's uh, beautiful that you're saying women and men and women are equal, but they are distinct. But ultimately, doesn't the Bible say wives submit to your husbands? Ultimately, doesn't the Bible exclude women from the office of an elder in a church? I'm sure you have those questions. I'm sure you want, you seek those clarifications. And, and I do want to address these questions. Before I address those questions head on, let, me, let us first be clear about what the Bible does not say. And then let's look at what the Bible does say. Three things the Bible does not say. First, the Bible does not say that all women are to submit to all the men in all of society. The Bible does not say that all women are to submit to all women in all of society. Not at all. This means the Bible frees and celebrates women who can be bosses over men. It celebrates women can be CEOs of companies. They can even be presidents or prime ministers of countries. Of course, they're going to be flawed just as men are flawed. But the Bible frees them. So there is no such limitation that the Bible imposes. Second, the Bible does not say that all women in the church are to be subject to all men in the church. The Bible does not say that. Say that. The Bible does say that all men in the church and all women in the church are to submit to the elders of the church. So all women in a church are to submit to the elders and pastors in the church, just like all men are also to submit to the elders and the pastors in the church, spiritually. Yes, the Bible does affirm male eldership, but I'll come to that in just a minute. Third, the Bible does not single out women for unilateral and unconditional and blind submission to their husbands. That's not a biblical view at all. And there are two sides of this coin. Husbands are to sacrificially love their wives as Christ loved the church, and wives are therefore to joyfully submit to their husbands as the church summits to Christ. Christ-like sacrificial giving by the husband and voluntary joyful submission by the wife must always be seen together. Good explanation. The objection still persists. The clarification still needs to be made. Still, why is this? Why does God call wives to submit to their husbands? Why does God call the church to submit to male eldership? Very real questions. The answer lies in a passage we've been looking at again and again. Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. 
male and female, he created them. Let me unpack this. When the Bible says that God created us in his image, it includes the meaning that God created mankind in his own triune image. Male and female, he created them. We are made in God's triune image. This is the key to understanding the objections and the clarification. We are made in God's triune image. Most of us know, those of us who are followers of Jesus, know and agree that God is a trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Are the Father and the Son equal? Absolutely yes. We know that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are absolutely co-equal in every way. The Son, Christ Jesus, is not at all inferior to the Father in any way. And the Father is not at all superior to Christ Jesus, the Son, in any way. The Father and the Son are absolutely co-equals with not even a tiny fraction of inequality between them. This is the most biblical, most basic biblical doctrine of the Trinity. The Father and the Son, Christ Jesus, are absolutely co-equals. Both were there from before the beginning of time, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That considered, how does the incarnate Christ, the Son, relate to and behave with the Father? The incarnate Christ always relates to the Father in voluntary, joyful, and co-equal submission. Only the Holy Spirit can help us get our minds around this. The incarnate Son always relates to the Father in voluntary, joyful, and co-equal submission. Co-equal submission. And this image of voluntary, joyful, and co-equal submission between the Father and the Son is the image in which God created humanity as male and female. So when the Bible says God made us in his image, it is this that is being mirrored, also this that is being mirrored. Just as the father and son are co-equal, the husband and wife are also co-equal. And just as the son submits to the father in voluntary, joyful, and co-equal submission, the wife submits to the husband in co-equal submission. So we're made male and female in God's triune image so that this relationship of voluntary, joyful, and co-equal submission between the father and the son is also mirrored in the human relationship between the husband and wife. This is what it means to be made male and female in the image of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. This is Paul speaking to the church. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. And the head of a wife is a husband. And the head of Christ is God. Paul is making the same connection. He's, this is what he's illustrating in this word. He's saying, just as the head of Christ is God, even though Christ, the Son, and God the Father are absolutely co-equal in every way, just as the head of Christ is God, so in that same image that we were created in, the head of wife is the husband, even though they are absolutely co-equal. Similarly, the church is God's family. Just like husband and wife are the biological family, 
the church is God's spiritual family. And so even within the spiritual family of the church, the same principle of voluntary, joyful, and co-equal submission continues. And that is why God has limited eldership to male in the church. As I said earlier, all women in the church do not submit to all men in the church. It's not a, a, a blanket hierarchical men, uh, men have other bosses, women. Have, that's not what God is saying. All men in the church have to submit to the elders. In the same way, all women in the church have to submit to the elders. The male eldership is again meant to mirror this relationship between the father and, and the son. If I had time, I would walk you through an entire Bible study that would take two hours. I'm sure none of you want that. Uh, and probably some of you are hoping the sermon will end soon. It is ending soon, less than five minutes. But what, I'm, what I am going to do is I'm going to circulate a document uh, explaining and discuss Bible study, explaining and discussing all this on the WhatsApp group. If any of you are interested in, in understanding this further, you, you'll find that helpful. But we do need to bring the sermon to a close now. If the idea of co-equal wives submitting to Christ-like husbands still bothers you, if it still bothers you, I respect that. If you still have that objection, I respect that. If it still bothers you, would you join me for the next couple of minutes in meditating on the sons in meditating on Jesus Christ, voluntary, joyful, and co-equal submission to his father. I have not come to do my will, Jesus said. I've come to do the will of him who sent me. The son can do nothing by himself, Jesus said. He can only do what he sees the Father doing. Father, if it is your will, let this cup pass from me, Jesus prayed on the night, on the eve of the day he was going to be crucified. Yet not my will, Father, but your will be done. Jesus said. At every step, the incarnate son gave himself to voluntary, joyful, and co-equal submission to the Father. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 8. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you made us male and female, that you made us in the image of God. And we pray, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, would you help every one of us understand the fullness of this? And would you help every one of us to grow in the fullness of this? Help us. Thank you. We pray. Amen. Amen.